Now let's move on to the next topic in CVS embryology that is development of interatrial septum. So between the right atrium and left atrium there is a septum and we are going to learn about the interatrial septum. And I want you all to be like more alert here. Why? Because topic is very simple. It's a very small topic, but it is a little bit tricky. We are going to come across septum primum, septum secundum, foramen primum, foramen secundum, and then foramen ovale. Later on after the birth, there'll be fossa ovalis and limbus fossa ovalis. So all this terminology, let's make it clear in next five minutes. So development of interatrial septum, first of all, try to understand from this diagram here. For example, if this one will be your developing heart. So in the developing heart, above you'll be actually having atria and below there'll be ventricle. Between the atria and the ventricle, there will be endocardial cushion. There will be endocardial cushion. Between the atria and the ventricle, there will be endocardial cushion. And now don't uh, think again ki from where is this endocardial cushion suddenly here. In the very beginning of cardiovascular system embryology, I told you endocardial cushion is also a derivative of splanchnopleuric lateral plate mesoderm. Now it is between the atria above and the ventricle below. Now our topic here is ab about the interatrial septum. So therefore, if this is your right atrium here and if this is the left atrium here, in the middle there will be formation of interatrial septum. So what I am going to do, I am not going to draw that entire diagram again and again. Let us just take only the atria from this diagram guys. So let us draw a separate diagram for development of the interatrial septum here, considering only the right atrium as well as the left atrium. So imagine this one here to be your right atrium here and this one here to be the left atrium. And there is a endocardial cushion over here. Now in between the right atrium and the left atrium, first of all, there will be formation of a septum. And that septum is descending down, descending down, descending down. But before merging or before meeting with the endocardial cushion, there will be a foramen present here. So there is a septum, the septum is moving down, moving down, descending down. And that septum has to actually go and meet with the endocardial cushion. Before meeting with that one, there is a formation of a foramen over there. So this septum is actually the septum primum. And the foramen here will be the foramen primum, of course. So let us write down the full names a little bit away from here. SP here stands for septum primum. And then FP here stands for foramen primum. Primum, of course, the first one. It is the first one to be formed here. Till here, no doubt. No student will have any doubt till here, guys. Now starts the confusion. Just try to understand here first and then later on we are going to write down the notes and draw the diagram. So I want you all to understand this very carefully. Now imagine my this hand here to be the endocardial cushion. Now if this is the endocardial cushion over here, just imagine my this hand here to be the septum primum. And this septum primum is coming down, coming down, coming down. But before meeting with the endocardial cushion, there is an opening here, there is a foramen here. That foramen is foramen primum. So septum primum and the foramen primum. No doubt till here. But now what will happen? Will it stop here? No. So it's going to still move down, move down, move down and further go and meet with the endocardial cushion. So when septum primum meets with the endocardial cushion, simultaneously at the same time, in the middle of that here, again one more foramen will be formed there. And that will be the foramen secundum. I repeat again, when the septum primum will go and meet with the endocardial cushion, at the same time, one more foramen will be formed in the middle and that foramen will be the foramen secundum. Let's draw the diagram of further development here. So what is the further development here, guys? Again, the same diagram here, the right atrium and the left atrium with the endocardial cushion in the middle here. I'm using the same color for the septum primum. So septum primum moves down and it is going to fuse with the endocardial cushion. But what is going to happen here, in the middle of that one more foramen is formed here and this time it is foramen secundum. So FS here stands for foramen secundum. Of course the second one, primum the first one and secundum the second one, foramen secundum. So what is the confusion among the students is that 
foramen primum and foramen secundum. Both of them are present in which septum only? Septum primum only. I repeat again, whether it is foramen primum or else whether it is the foramen secundum, both of these foramens are present in which septum only? They are present in septum primum only. Till now, I did not come across the septum secundum. Now what is going to happen, just adjacent to this septum, there is a formation of one more septum here and that septum, again the same story, it is going to descend down but it is not going to merge, it is not going to meet with the endocardial cushion. That septum is septum secundum and in this septum again the same thing, there will be one opening over here and this foramen is referred to as foramen oval. Oh -ho. So what is the foramen present in the septum secundum? that is foramen ovale. So, S, S here stands for septum secundum, septum secundum, whereas F O here stands for foramen ovale, foramen ovale guys. Now, this is the way how the interatrial septum is formed before the birth. So, before the birth, this is how the interatrial septum is formed. And I hope all of you knows that if this is your right atrium over here and left atrium over here, during development, the pressure in the right atrium will be more when compared to that of the left atrium. So, therefore, the blood will be flowing from right atrium via this foramen ovale into the left atrium. I hope you all remember the fetal circulation. So, during development in the fetal circulation, the blood will be shunting from the right atrium into the left atrium via that foramen ovale. That is how the circulation is going to take place. That is before the birth. Now, what is happening to that one after the birth? And that is something more interesting, guys. What is happening after the birth? So, I will just try to erase this one here. You do not try to do it in your diagram there. So, after the birth, what happens here? I hope you all remember that very famous thing. The foramen ovale will be closed. And in the place of that foramen ovale, you will be having a saucer-shaped depression. There will be a depression present. And in anatomy, we all know depression is nothing but fossa. It is known as fossa ovalis. So, before the birth, it will be foramen, foramen opening, foramen ovale. And after the birth, it is going to become a depression there. And that is known as the fossa ovalis. So, you just try to imagine here, this is how the depression is formed here. You just try to, just try to imagine that after the birth, it is going to become a depression that is fossa ovalis and that fossa ovalis above it will be having a margin and that margin is known as the limbus fossa ovalis. We have learned about all these things in the thorax topic. Okay, If you wish to see this one, let me show you that in one diagram over here. So, just look at this diagram here sir. Again the same thing, interior structure of the right atrium and inside the right atrium you are able to appreciate here there is a depression. And that depression is actually referred to as fossa ovalis. And just above the fossa ovalis, this margin that you are able to appreciate here, this is nothing but the limbus fossa ovalis. Now, you got to learn what is forming the floor of that fossa ovalis and then what is going to form the margin of that fossa ovalis. And you can learn that very, very easily with the help of my diagram over here, guys. If you just look at the floor, if you look at the floor of the fossa ovalis, the floor of the fossa ovalis is formed by this red colored septum there, that is septum primum, whereas the margin above will be formed that blue colored septum over there, that is septum secundum. Crystal clear concept, you do not have to mug up at all. So, you just imagine my hand here to be this red colored one, septum primum, and you imagine this blue colored one, septum secundum, both of them are going to fuse together. So, therefore, here the floor, the floor of the fossa ovalis is formed by septum primum, whereas the margin above is formed by the septum secundum. Let us just write that and finish it off. So, before the birth, you have an opening. Opening in anatomy is referred to as foramen, that is foramen ovale. And after the birth, that foramen ovale will be actually closed. In the place of that foramen ovale, you just have a depression. Depression is known as fossa, fossa ovalis. For that fossa ovalis, you got to remember like two points. Number one, the floor of the fossa ovalis. Number two, the margin. And the margin is also referred to as limbus, limbus fossa ovalis. And from our diagram, it is like crystal clear. The floor is formed by septum 
primum septum primum and then the margin is actually formed by the septum secundum septum secundum guys and that completes the entire story of interatrial septum development development of interatrial septum before the birth and then what's happening after the birth now the next topic that we are going to move on is with development of interventricular septum guys so development of interventricular septum very much important now development of interventricular septum between the two ventricles right ventricle and left ventricle it's a very important topic when it comes to exam point of view but it's very easy topic guys i'll tell you how to remember that in a easy manner now interventricular septum you first remember it has got like three parts interventricular septum has got three parts number 1 there will be muscular part muscular part of interventricular septum number 2 there will be membranous part membranous part of the interventricular septum and number 3 there will be the bulbar part bulbar part or you can refer to that as bulbar septum so first you learn this three words in your mind so there are three parts in the interventricular septum number 1 muscular part number 2 there will be membranous part and number 3 there will be bulbar part and the only thing that you have to do here is you just got to remember like they are derived from where all these three parts they are derived from where you just have to remember this one here now you just imagine here that this one will be the ventricles here guys the right ventricle and the left ventricle the chambers present below and i told you there will be endocardial cushion in the middle here this is your endocardial cushion now what is going to happen first of all the cardiac muscles present in the wall of the ventricle they are they will be giving one evagination here so it's like quite simple to remember here follow my diagram the cardiac muscles present in the wall of the ventricle are going to form an evagination there and even a simple you know first year mbbs student can understand there if this part is an evagination coming from cardiac muscle that has to be definitely which part only muscular part muscular part now seeing this even the endocardial cushion will also contribute a small part over here and that part which is contributed by the endocardial cushion is referred to as the membranous part that is nothing but the second part that is membranous part it is just a schematic diagram to remember guys so with the diagram somehow i am sure you will be able to remember that forever so muscular part of interventricular septum will be derived from where only cardiac muscles or we can say the myocardium cardiac muscle myocardium the membranous part of the interventricular septum is derived from endocardial cushion now what about the bulbar part bulbar part is actually derived from again the neural crest cells neural crest cells are the one which are going to form the bulbar part which is present above that one now in our diagram here in our schematic diagram here you are not able to appreciate that one let me show you an important diagram and one important conclusion as well now my dear friends look at this beautiful diagram over here i'll be using actually the same numbers number 1 here you are able to appreciate the muscular part number 2 here you are able to appreciate the membranous part and just above that you are also able to appreciate the bulbar part number 3 here now the beauty of this concept here is that just above that you will be actually having the truncus arteriosus i hope you all remember during development of the heart i told you very very clearly truncus arteriosus is going to form ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk and where is the blood coming into those blood vessels from your ventricles and ventricle which part outflow part outflow part is developing from where only the conus so this part will be actually the conus so truncus arteriosus and just beneath that will be having the conus what is that septum forming inside the truncus arteriosus the septum forming inside the truncus arteriosus will be aortico pulmonary septum aortico pulmonary septum is also referred to as the spiral septum spiral septum and i told you already very very clearly in the development of the heart that spiral septum will be derived from neural crest cells 
just that spiral septum itself will continue down that spiral septum itself will continue down to form the bulbar part or this bulbar septum number 3 which i have given here that is bulbar septum and that's how you can remember easily from my diagram here that even that is also derived from the neural crest cells only so spiral septum is derived from neural crest cells that will continue down as bulbar septum and even that is also derived from where only guys neural crest cells and one beautiful thing a beautiful question which was asked in your exam was truncus arteriosus is having a spiral septum and the conus is actually having the bulbar septum the continuation of that these two septum together that is bulbar septum and the spiral septum together it is referred to as cono truncal septum it is referred to as cono truncal septum why because it is the conus and the truncus part where you have the septum in a continuation guys so therefore there is a beautiful name given there it's cono truncal septum and that was actually asked in the exam cono truncal septum is derived from where and again your answer has to be neural crest cells only cono truncal septum is nothing but bulbar septum plus spiral septum and even that is also derived from where only even the cono truncal septum is also derived from neural crest cells only awesome that's the reason why my dear friends one more thing that we can do here we can integrate our anatomy with the clinical application here if there is any problem in the neural crest cells that is going to have abnormality in the spiral septum and not only that it will also have the abnormality in the bulbar septum and if it is in, in bulbar septum bulbar septum is actually a part of your interventricular septum leading to ventricular septal defects vsd vsd guys that's all so finally to conclude our topic here we were actually studying about the interventricular septum and remember simply three points to remember how many parts do you have in the interventricular septum muscular part derived from cardiac muscle membranous part derived from endocardial cushion and finally the bulbar part bulbar part is actually derived from the neural crest cells that completes the topic of development of interatrial septum and interventricular septum so according to our planning we are done with development of heart development of interatrial septum and ventricular septum inside that now we have to learn about the development of arterial system and development of the venous system one by one thank you